Hello and welcome to new 207 class. And uh, today we are going to go over chapter one and we are going to introduce you to scaling networks. So in this semester, we're gonna be talking about how to design a LAN and this is will be our chapter one. We'll talk about how to design a LAN and then we'll get into a little bit about STP next week on the next chapter. Then we get into OSPF and, um, and EIGRP in details. Then we'll cover also some wireless network and towards the end we'll be able to troubleshoot a network. So this part of the network is part of the, um, the CCNA. So when we, when we finish out 207 and 209, we'll be really learning the second part of the CCNA. All right, so let's get right into chapter one, which really looks at two things, how to design a LAN and what equipment are needed and the features of these equipments. Specifically, we're talking about routers and switches. So we're gonna describe what type of routers that are available for us for a medium, for a small to a medium size networks, um, the different types of I operating systems that are out there, what switches are available for us, and which ones should we choose, what, what what features we should we be looking at, and things like that. All right, so when we are designing a LAN, let's begin. When we're designing a LAN, you should think about scaling, scaling needs and network scaling needs. Scaling means easy to expand. The ability to expand the network without compromising security, uh, traffic, and um, and management. So you should be able to add a new switch or a new LAN or new VLAN and configure it and not having to worry about uh, others in another LAN that are going to be, uh, they're going to have, you, you know, it should be transparent to the other pair, to the other LANs. So that means you don't, don't even should know that they have just added a network. Okay. We have to be able to support critical applications. So for example, some, uh, some departments may need access to specific applications. They always should have access to it regardless. So we have to create some redundancies in case there's some sort of a failure. Our network should support converged network traffic, for example, be able to carry voice over IP, data, HTTP, streaming videos, all at the same time on the same wires. Support diverse business needs, being able, for example, to reach e-commerce or doing HTTP DNS servers going outside and being able to communicate with the rest of the world and of course having security being able to connect to the cloud for example you may use cloud computing which really means saving your data up into the um, into a server that is not on campus and provide centralized administrative control being at, being able to control and uh, all the devices that are on your network. So here's question one that you should answer for, um, for homework. Question number one, what are the network scaling needs? And there they are. So this is question number one, what are the network scaling needs? And here are your answers, the, these four um, bullet points. So please write those down in a Microsoft Word like we've been doing and you submit that. There's a few questions coming up as we move along. All right, an enterprise business network. So he's a typical enterprise business network. This is a typical large company, for example, and that's going to provide a high reliability network. So for example, if you have your main site, and uh, so you may have two different connections or maybe three different connections that connect you to the internet, you can go outside you may have some remote access coming in through either dial-up or a private wan which we'll discuss next semester in 209 or maybe you'll be using the internet so all of that that is something that is um, you may encounter when when you're on the job you have a corporate that wants to be able to connect to the internet uh, to access using the vpn to access for example their data center you may have some remote users they want to use, for example, also the internet to get into the uh, the main site. You may have something also the old telephone wires, for example, ISDN may still be set up, and you only use ISDN 
you, you only pay for ISDN when you are using it. So a lot of corporates now have ISDN already set up from the old days, and they, they never turn it down because they really don't have to pay for it unless they are using it. So they use, leave that for, um, for backup. So there's a chance that you may have to support ISDN. In terms of WAN connections for private one, when your data is really secured and is needed, so you may, you know, you'll use the private one. So that's something similar to PPP or having a team online or frame relay specifically or an ATM connections. But all of that will be discussed I, next semester, not really this semester when we're talking about WAN connection outside your LAN either through the internet or the private uh, WAN. All right, now, when you are designing your LAN, you should think of the hierarchical network design, which really like a tree method. You start the top with the core layer, so the core layer connects to the outside world, then the distribution layer, with the distribution layer when things come in from outside into the core layer, which is really like a, either the, a layer three switch or a router could be here, then it goes to the distribution layer. So for example, let's say you only have one big, huge building, and in that building you have an engineering department, you have a sales department, a production department, and so on. And so the distribution layer will have one connection to the access layer, and the access layer is where the engineering is. This will be the sales. And another would be, for example, the production. So when the data comes in into the core, it goes to the distribution and the distribution layer uh, distributes the data to the access layer. So this way, if you wanted to add another department, you just put another switch and attach it to the distribution layer. This is the most secure and scalable way of designing your LAN, the three layer model, core, distribution, core layer, distribution, and the access. And as you can see, we have doubled up and the reason you double up on these devices is for redundancy purposes. You need to do that in case any of these devices go down. You want the other one to pick up immediately without any interruption. Because your number one job when you are on the site is for all devices to have access to their resources regardless. Regardless of what's going on. So you got to have redundancies. you got to make sure that everybody has access to whatever they need 24 7 if that's what's required all right question number two what are the three layers that are needed in the hierarchical network design and the answer is core distribution and the access layer those are the three layers all right the the cisco enterprise architecture breaks down into four different areas you have the enterprise campus this is where you know that we were talking about the core distribution and the access layer is this is everything on campus this is where uh, you know your land will be in the whole building and then these can go out into an enterprise for example you can go out into a private wan or for uh, either a private wan or using a VPN using the internet, and then you may use a frame relay to get into your data center someplace. Or you may use, you know, this is the enterprise edge where you first connect to. You may connect to an internet to get on the internet. You may use e-commerce if, if your company sells stuff on the internet. And then the third layer is the ISPs. So you want to be able to have you know, if you have some e-commerce stuff, you may want to have multiple ISPs because you want the whole world outside to be able to have access to you. And so if you lose an ISP or for whatever reason they go down, you always have an alternative. Even for Internet connectivity, you may have, you know, like I discussed earlier, you may have some sort of a an old, you know, uh, dial-up. Right. So a teleworker may use the dial-up to get into your network or a remote user or remote branch may use an ISP to get into the campus. All right, so you got the enterprise campus, that's where all your devices are. And so these get special devices such as layer three switches or routers or layer two switches. Then you got the enterprise edge. This is important for to be able to connect to the outside world and then the service provider edge is the one that offers allows the enterprise edge. So you want to be able to have 
this is where you you know this is where you have in on the enterprise edge you have your um I don't know, your e-commerce, HTTP servers, e-commerce servers, internet connectivity, remote VPN devices that allows you to connect to the outside world. And the service provider edge obviously means being able to have the service providers. So this is the equipment for the service provider to allow you to have this connection. And the remote side is, you know, you are at home or another remote branch. What devices do they need to connect into the main enterprise campus all right what are the primary cisco enterprise architecture what are the four enterprise architectures of cisco the four of them this is question number three and they are enterprise campus enterprise edge the service provider edge and the remote by the way we're not going to do any packet tracer in this chapter this chapter is pretty straightforward you just need to understand really how to design a LAN and some of the equipment later on. We'll do a little bit of hands-on when we get to class. We'll have that set up for us. So this is a pretty straightforward, um, really, chapter. It should not be that long. Failure domains. Failure domains means that uh, if a device fails, it's going to affect a whole bunch of users. For example, if a switch goes down, then, of course, the domain is everybody that are attached to that switch. So it will go down, of course, will not have any connection. So that is crucial. You got to make sure that you, re you reduce the impact of failure on that switch. So maybe you'll have another switch that takes over immediately. If a link that connects between one switch and another goes down, so you may have, we need another link just in case of another redundant link. And the redundant link means um, a link that just sits idle in case you know, a link, you know, uh, another trunk. Remember we talked about trunks when we talked about VLANs last semester? When we, when you have two switches that are connected to each other by a trunk. Now, if that trunk fails, then both floors, the first and the second floor, will not have any connection. So, therefore, you should definitely have another trunk, but that other trunk should just sit idle. No traffic should be traveling on it, and it's only there just in case the main, the primary trunk fails and then that will take over, okay? So we gotta take a look at, uh, at these devices, the centralized point of failure, such as routers and switches, links. We gotta make sure we have redundancy in there to make sure that if a failure occurs, uh, the other link or the other switch takes over immediately. All right, so you gotta design for scalability to make sure that you are expandable. So you don't want to buy a switch with only 24 ports and then design your LAN around that and the company starts to expand. Then you have to strip everything back down and start all over again. You can't do that. You have to design your LAN so that uh, it's easy to expand. Scalable, in other words, right? So you got to be able to add, upgrade, modify without affecting anything. Anything means security, traffic, whatever. All right, it has to be, like I said earlier, transparent to everyone else. All right, so uh, we'll take a look at here. For example, here is some planning for redundancies, having additional connections, for example, in this example, uh, to this server form. So you may have somewhere where you have your HTTP servers, DHCP servers, application servers, file servers, um, your data, that you are backing up and you want to have connection to it. So here is your wiring closet. This is where your access is. And this is where all the users connect to. So they want to be able to have the access to the state form. So what you do is you put several switches with multiple mesh connections so that these access switches have multiple paths to get to the server form. By the way, data only travels in one path. Let's say this path only. And the others are just sitting there redundancy in redundant. So in case if one link goes down, the other one picks up immediately. We're going to discuss this next week in we're using the spanning tree protocol. The spanning tree protocol allows redundancies without any problems. And it's running by default on all Cisco switches. So that's for next week. So um, we'll, we'll talk about that next week. All right. But redundancy is crucial in terms of for trunking because these can do go down anytime and then you will not have any connection to the server 
So we got to have redundancy. That's very important. Also, if you have, for example, layer three switches, and you may be only using one or two ports to go to the access layer switch. So why not those other ports that are not being used, we can bundle them together, aggregate these ports together to give you higher bandwidth. So if, let's say you have one port that is running at 100 megabits per second, and you have a nine additional ports that are not being used. There are software on the switch that allow you to use all 10 ports together at the same time that can send data to this switch. So you'll achieve a gigabit ethernet. You're using unused ports, in other words. Okay, you increase your bandwidth. But that's a feature that you have to have on the switch to enable you to do link aggregation. And the ether channel is the one that allows you to do that. So ether channel is a form of link aggregation used in a switched network to allow you to use unused ports to bundle up the port speed to increase the bandwidth. Okay, if you don't have the ether, if you don't have ether channel on your switch, then you will not be able to do that. You will not be able to do link aggregation. Also, as you probably all know, if you have a wired LAN and some users come in with their, like you guys, some of you come into class and you may have your laptops and you want to connect to the wireless LAN. So what you do is, is you have an access point that connects to the wired network, such as an 802.11 AB, ABG, NAB or AD, whatever type of network. And then all users can connect to this access point and then from that access point, you'll have access to the wired network. So to expand the wired LAN, you could do it wirelessly. But remember, this is also a central point of failure. If this access point, this wireless router fails, then all the wireless devices that connect to it will lose connection to the LAN, right? And of course, if everybody is trying to get here, that's gonna slow connections to 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 the wire to the wired network so it's preferable to be on the wired it's much quicker you don't have to compete with everybody that is wireless to this wireless LAN. again in chat i think in one of those chapters chapter three we'll talk about wireless LAN. that's a, a whole chapter by itself and how to set it up and how to secure it the whole nine yards all right also if you have a very large um, network you may have to do routing between them. So you may separate these large networks into different areas and OSPF allow you to have multiple areas. For example, you know, one area of the campus could be area 51 and another area could be called area one. We have multiple routers there. And remember we did last semester um, area zero. Remember that's the mother. You have to have area zero. That's the core. And then all areas have to go through area zero to get from one area to another. So we'll discuss how to do multiple area OSPF this semester to allow connection and for easier traffic. So this is, you can expand this. It's not really for, it's mostly for um, scalability. OSPF allows unlimited, allowed of, you know, you can have another area connected to area 51 to get. So you can expand almost unlimited expansion with OSPF, okay? So we'll talk about that. I don't know how you, um, if you, when you get on the job, you'll be able to, well, you never know. You know, you may work for a big company that is doing multiple OSBF. But anyway, we'll learn how to do that and set that up. All right, but again, area zero has to be there. That's the first area you have to create. You cannot create any other area before the mother, area zero. All right, now let's talk about the devices. What kind of devices do you need and what features do they have? All right, so uh, when we're talking about switches, there are several form factors. There is the fixed, the module, the stackable, and non-stackable. These are the typical ones that you see in our lab. The fixed one are you cannot expand them. You get 24 ports or 48 ports, and that's it. You can't go beyond that. Modular ones are like the ones that you have opened up and you can add more ports. So these, you know, we're talking somewhere north of, a, you know, hundred thousand, fifty to $100,000 modules. These are very expensive. These are for data centers, very high speed. We're talking about gigabits and they can have, you know, 
hundreds or even thousands of ports. Cloud computing switches, you have the service provider switches, virtual switches, there's wireless switches. So these are the modulars. The stackable ones are somewhat similar to the fixed one, but in the back, you can daisy chain them. So if you have a 24 port and you want to add another 24 port to make it 48 ports, you can stack them on top of each other. And a link in the back can connect them to each other. So those are the stackable. The non-stackable ones are just, you know, like the fixed one exactly. Okay, now, port density. What is port density? Port density means how many ports do you need? So, port density is how many ports are needed to uh, for your LAN. So, typically, uh, find out how many users, how many users, not how many LANs you need, how many users you need, and that's really how many ports you are going to purchase. Of course, you want to go, go a little bit more than that just in case you... Uh, you need to, if some users need to be get in there, to get in there on the spot and for trunking purposes. So you may add a few uh, more ports. Uh, if you have a modular ones, of course, you can have thousands of ports. Okay. But this is for a small network. And of course, uh, you can do VLANs in this. Okay. To save ports really down the road all right so port density is how many ports you need and it all depends on how many users you have forwarding rates so feature number one what features on the switch you should consider the first thing that this is question number i think four if i'm mistaken oh come on where is that mouse here you go so the first thing you should look for is a feature on the switch is the port density Second is forwarding rates, how fast these ports are going to be. That's another feature you should be looking for a switch. And of course, um, the gigabit is better than fast Ethernet, which is 100 megabits per second. So if you got the money to spend and so, and, you're at, and your company require, you know, has um, applications that require high forwarding rates, so you, have, you may have no choice but to go with... Um, gigabit but i'll tell you right now the most expensive in designing a gigabit ethernet is the switch not necessarily the NICs or even the cables because the ports can go close to a hundred dollars a port so you know if you have a lot of users that want to use gigabit ethernet that's going to be pretty expensive all right number three number three feature is power over ethernet so you can have your switch send power to an ip phone or an access phone without these devices, the IP phone or the access phone being, being plugged in into an outlet. Because we'll use one of the eight wires in the ethernet to send power to your device. That's nice, right? But the problem is if the switch fails, then you're in trouble. Then these devices don't get power. Or you may have power pass through where you can send power to a switch and then the switch will send power to all power to all the devices so you could do that as well so that's another feature power over ethernet that's number three feature okay those are the three different features now multi-layer switching that's number four multi-layer switching meaning a switch is able to do uh, layer three in other words uh, being able to have access to the packets that are encapsulated in the frame. If a switch does not has not the ability or cannot access the packet that's inside the frame, then that switch is called a layer two switch, right? Because it only moves frames around. You want layer three switches to um, do inter VLAN routing. Remember we did that last semester in 205, I think it's in chapter two. If you're not familiar with that, Go back and review VLAN chapter. I think it was chapter two, if I'm not mistaken. Chapter two or three. Maybe three. I don't know. Which one of those chapters, right? All right. So do you need multi-layer three switches? Probably a good idea. Even uh, to have that feature in there. So that's feature number four. Excuse me. Now, when it comes to a router, that's it for uh, the four features of the layer. Uh, for the switch now let's go to the router what kind of 
features do you need on the router? Well, the routers is the ones that are used to interconnect lands together that are in different geographic areas, far away from each other. So switches don't do that, layer three switches. Layer three switches really just for inter, for VLAN connection within the building. You use a router to go outside to connect to ISPs, for example, all right? Allows uh, more securities, right? To connect to ISPs, it provides you redundant paths. It runs um, advanced routing protocols such as OSPF and EIGRP and so on, right? And usually routers are sits on the edge of your land and they get all the traffic coming in and out. So you can use them as a firewall. You can use them as DHCP like we did that last semester. And we able to set it up as firewall. So you have to be able to protect your router because it sits on the edge. Because that's the one that connects you to the outside world. Right? And also routers are able to translate between media. So if you have... You know, a copper wire coming into the router, the router can take the data from a copper wire, send it to a fiber optic wire, right? So here are some typical routers. You have the service provider routers, the branch routers, or the network edge routers. The network edge is the one that will be on campus. Those are the expensive ones, right? That's where you can add more ports. You can have thousands of ports in here to connect you. But if you have some small branch office someplace, you may use one of these routers. But they have to be able, you know, to be running 24-7. All right. And here are the different router hardware that are out there. You know, in our labs, we work with the 2811, the mid-size business type of routers. They go about close to two grand a piece. Uh, sometimes we work with the 3800. These are the very expensive ones for really um, big corporates with lots of user connections, right? You may use the wireless LAN or the 800 series for a very sm for a small network, or even the 1800 may be used. All right. Now, when it comes to the iOS and licensing. Uh, this is the latest and the greatest operating system that should be on your router, the 15.1 fourth released. Okay, so you should be looking for one. And typically every 20-month 20, 20 time frame between the extended uh, ma maintenance releases. So you go from one to another. I think we are up to 15.1. I'm not sure what we have on our routers. If you type show, ver show version, that will tell you. We'll practice some of that in class, by the way. Uh, looking at the commands and looking at our operating system and the name for it. All right, there are two different ways of uh, managing the switch or the router. You can manage it out of bound, like you take a console port where you, uh, you know, a console cable from your PC, you connect it to your serial port, you connect it to the console. That means you're from outside going into using the either the console or the auxiliary port. But typically it's the console port. The first time you want to connect to the router to configure it, to manage it, you have to be out of bound using the console port. Now, it's preferable once you do, once you get in through the app bound, you configure it. You should be able to tell net into the router or SSH or use an HTTP that you means you're using one of the ethernet ports to get in. So that means you will never have to be right next to the physically close to the router to connect to it. You can use inbound. That means through the Ethernet ports you're getting in, right? That's called inbound, inbound configuration. And here are some typical commands that we already done. We went through all of this from configuring the host name on a router, setting up the secret password, using setting up the out of bound connection to the console zero right we'll do some of these we'll practice all of this we're going to review all of this in class that will be part of our class activity hopefully i'll remember that when we're doing that on day one and we'll also take a look at all of these commands and what they mean and what they do show ip protocols for example displays all the different routing protocols dynamic routing protocols that are running on your router 
show IP route, for example, um, displays the routing table. So you want to make sure that the in, all the entries are there. And if they're not, get them there. Um, we'll take a look at show IP interfaces, show OSPF neighbor, all of these. Show IP interface brief that displays the you know quick display of the interfaces to see if they're up and running, if they have the correct uh, configuration, IP configuration. All right, pretty much the same thing with the switch. So we'll do all of that too. So we'll have um, a good practice for our hands on. It should be pretty easy because we are all familiar with this. We've been doing it in 205 almost every day, right? And all the different show commands on the switch as well. So we'll practice all of that and we'll write down exactly what each of these commands are needed for. Okay, because most likely when you take your CCNA, uh, there's a good chance that you may have not a good chance. There's always a question that here's a display, here's a problem, and what are you going to do? You got to use one of those show commands to troubleshoot. So the show commands will give you information about if the device has been configured correctly or not, or um, give me some information so I can find out. Um, if I can ping something or trace route something or whatever. All right. So you need, in other words, you need to know all these different types of show commands and what output do they give you? Well, they give you all of that in here, right? So just to go back, I want for question number five, I want you to write down the basic show commands for a router. All of these, please write those down. That's question number five. And what each one of them mean. And when we get into class, we can actually see the outputs. And question number six is the basic switch show commands. Please write those down and write what each one of those mean. All right. So those are your six questions that you have to submit from homework number one. All right. So I think it was a pretty straightforward chapter. Hopefully, uh, you are ready to start STP next next week. And uh, so make sure you do your homework. Don't forget to do your assessment and your iLabs. Well, read, read chapter one. That's the most important thing right now. Read chapter one after you go over the lecture that we just went over. And um, I'll see you guys on the day one. All right.